Uh, my name's Ron McGill. I'm very proud to be a Nikon ambassador. But uh, I'm always a little self-conscious coming and speaking at, at these wonderful venues because I'm really not, photography's not my living. I'm a zoologist. I'm a conservationist. Photography's a tool that I use to get people to care about wildlife. I mean, the bottom line is, uh, you know, I, I, I work at a zoo down in Miami. I've been there for 38 years, but I didn't work at a zoo to work for an attraction. I work to try to help conservation efforts. I'm very proud to have raised millions of dollars for conservation around the world. Um, I've got an endowment that's millions of dollars in my name down in Miami that I use for different conservation efforts. So photography has been a huge tool for me to get those people connected. Um, I, I get kind of intimidated sometimes, and I listen to all the professional photographers come up here, and I say, well, you know, it's this, and it's this, and it's this, and, and it's this. For me, the difference between me and a real professional photographer is a professional photographer creates an image. They do things with their lighting, and they do all things with flash. I capture a moment. I'm photographing wildlife. I can't say, well, wait a minute. Can you step a little to the left, look a little to the sun? Uh, you know, if you shift, I can't do that. You know, I've got to be able to capture things right away. And I'll get more into depth on that in my major talk in the main lobby uh, this afternoon. But uh, you know, Dave asked me, he said, Ron, can you put together something else, you know, something I could do in the, in the second stage? You know, I said, sure. You know, I, I think one of the things that we as photographers sometimes get intimidated by is you hear a lot of, well, you know, I went to Africa and I did this stuff, and I went to India and I did this stuff. And man, wildlife is everywhere, folks. Everywhere. For me, I live in Miami. So I've got the Everglades. Here you've got some great national parks, some regional parks, some reserves around the areas. You go up to Bear Mountain, places like I mean, there's some fantastic places here where you can film all kinds of wildlife. What I did, and I'm not necessarily a bird guy, and I know this talk, I think, says birds of the Everglades. I got some other things in here, too, but timing is everything with wildlife. And patience, understanding patience. When it's breeding season, things are cooking because everything starts cooking in breeding season. Females make males stupid in breeding season, OK? <laughs> so you get a lot of great action and stuff going on. There's this drive to reproduce. The Everglades is a wonderful place. But I'm always amazed in the national parks. People will go to national parks, and we'll go to some place like the Everglades. It's, oh, sunrise in the Everglades. You look at it. It's, oh, it's nice. But what they see is this. There's nothing out here. This is as far as I can see. It's just sawgrass and marsh. But you got to look closer. you got to walk around. you got to go in the right time. I wouldn't go to the Everglades in August and September, because you're going to get a blood transfusion in about 10 minutes. Okay? <laughs> go there in January, February, when the water's low, and it's concentrated in puddles, and everything's concentrated in that water. So what happens when the water's low? All the fish, their house gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and there's a lot more fish in this little house. So what happens to the birds that eat the fish? It's a smorgasbord. We don't have to go fighting all over the place. They're all right here. They're stuck here. So you work on that, and birds start changing color, and they start changing behavior. And you know, you start seeing little things, and all of a sudden you see a white great eagle, and you say, oh, there it is, it's beautiful looking out in the glade, so peaceful. And you think, well, it's just a bird. It's just a bird with some marsh and a lot of grass. Guys, you probably know a lot more about the technical portion of photography than I do. I just use it to get a message across, to connect people to wildlife, you see? So when you look at this bird, and you look at this marsh, and you say, what is out there? Again, look closer. All of a sudden, you'll start hearing things like the frogs. You go down in the Everglades, frogging time, these people eat this stuff. They go out there, they gig them. They have these little, like, little um, you know, swords that they go and they, they gig the frog, and they eat them. And I, I got to admit, I've had it. It's not so bad, OK? <laughs> but there's tons of these frogs everywhere. And then when the alligator holes, when the water goes down, and all the alligators are concentrated in the water like this at one place, it's fantastic, because that's when breeding season starts coming. In April, March and April, you go to the Everglades, and you'll start hearing these sounds. You'll start hearing. <laughs> Sounds like somebody trying to start a, a, a weed eater or a lawnmower. <laughs> what the heck is going on there? You see these big bull gators start getting up on the surface, and these big, massive guys. This guy was about 15 feet long. Comes up to me. And what I like to do with these guys is I like to get down low. Always try to get down low to the level where these animals are to get these images. I'm six foot six. And I, I always come home, and my bellies and my clothes are always really. My wife goes, what are you doing? I go, i got to get down on the ground, honey. you got to get down and shoot this stuff at a different level. It makes a different, uh, 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 different perspective. So you try to get these things like the reflections. Folks, I can sit in an alligator pool forever when the, when the water's down, because there's all kinds of interactions that are going on. You see? This is a male. He's getting by the female. He's asking permission here. It's so, people look at alligators and they say, oh my god, they're these horrible, malicious monsters, right? They're always biting each other and they're slapping their tails and everything. 
well, you know what? When it comes around to alligator love, it's a whole different thing. It's beautiful. No, it's really beautiful. Because first you hear the males, they kind of go, and they make this sound. And when they do that, they create this infrastructure in their belly that they do. They'll, they'll raise their head, and then they'll slap the water. You'll be walking down, and all of a sudden you hear, splat, like that. And that's their job. They'll make this big popping sound of the water. And that's the way to kind of get the female's attention, and also to tell these other males, hey, listen. I'm around here. This is my territory. Don't be messing with these females. This is mine. And they'll do that over and over. And then when that doesn't work, to get a little bit more into depth, you'll start seeing them raising their heads to make themselves look bigger. These are males challenging each other, going, hey, 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 hey. Because they get stupid. The females make them stupid. So they get up and down, and, uh, and they're making this noise. And then when they start vibrating their bodies, it's fantastic because they vibrate their bodies, they bring it out of the ground, and it vibrates like this, and this water dances off their back. It goes, Ooh! it just bubbles off the back. The females think that's hot. They go over and look at them, they go, hey, I like the way you do that. They seriously come swimming around like this. You know, I'm a zoologist. I've dedicated my life to conservation, but I also believe, folks, if there's a simple way to say something, say it simply. I'm not a big fan of using all these big SAT words to sound intelligent and sound technical. This alligator is flirting with other alligators, OK? He's going, hey, making, making that thing, making that dance, uh, that water dance in the back. And it really is fantastic the way they do it. It's right after they do the and all that bam, and the female comes around, swims around, she goes, oh, and she goes, hey, baby, how you doing? <laughs> OK? And he swims around. And you, you know, as a photographer, what you're doing is you're really observing this closer. You're not just taking a picture, you're watching the behavior. I learn something every day when I'm out photographing these animals. I'll sit out here all day long at these gator pools in these different areas, and I learn something every day by watching them. It's amazing how gentle they can be. Then they get a little, the males start challenging. They get next to each other, hey, 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 and they do a little back and forth, you know. But then, okay, he settles out, one goes one way, one goes the other way. Then it's time for the female to come along. And she's like, hey, baby, how are you? And it's so gentle. You would never think that these alligators, these massive, you know, massive beasts, gently puts his arm around her back, and they twirl in the water, and they do the little thing that they do. And it's beautiful to watch. It really is fantastic. So that's what people think. Everglades is alligators, just alligators, right? It's a lot more animals in the Everglades. You see a lot of alligators. We have well over a million alligators in the state of Florida now. So they're all over the place. There's also some other animals. If you're very, very lucky, incredibly patient, and sometimes have some help, like a rehabilitated animal that's been rehabilitated so you know where it is and you know where you can photograph it, and then we have these invasive species. Florida has become the Ellis Island of exotic animals, OK? <laughs> Unfortunately, when they get loose in South Florida, it's like they're in Club Med. They start breeding, and all of a sudden, we've got these iguanas everywhere, folks. They're destroying gardens. They're de destroying so many things. And people are like, oh, it looks so tropical. I feel like I'm in the Bahamas. Well, you're not in the Bahamas. You're in South Florida, and they're starting to eat all kinds of the native landscape. They're going into some of the tropical gardens that we have there. This is becoming a real issue. So that, you've heard about the pythons. I don't put snake pictures up here because people hate snake pictures. So, but you know, we've got pythons. I mean, where in the United States you got a 12-foot python crossing the road? This is kind of freaking people out. Here in New York, you're lucky. Thing gets out. As soon as December, January comes along, it's dead. OK? <laughs> we don't have, that, we don't have that, that safety net down in South Florida. If you get really lucky, Florida panther. Probably only 200 of them left in the state. But an incredible animal. And again, you know, folks, I, I watch these wildlife shows these days, and it really bothers me. Because I grew up at a time when wildlife shows were like the National Geographic specials. Or my favorite show, Sunday night, 7.30, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, OK, with Jim Fowler and Marlon Perkins. And those shows, they taught you, they inspired you to want to learn more about nature. You wanted to go out and learn about this stuff because it showed you how wonderful it was, how magnificent it was. Today, what do you have on television? When animals attack five, the world's deadliest, river monsters. I mean, it's, all it does is teach kids to be afraid of the outdoors. It's the biggest mistake in messaging that we have. And I hope that pendulum swings back till we get back to the old David Attenborough delivery of what nature really is. Fascinating, something to always respect, but not necessarily fear. So that's what I hope I do, because when I saw Florida Panther the first time, folks, I got to tell you something. It was beyond orgasmic. It was like, oh my god, I can't believe this. And you're sitting here just taking pictures, you go, oh my god, this is such an, and that animal, that animal was never a threat to me. Never a threat to me. I've come across bears and panthers and stuff. You just sit there, you feel so lucky. And that's the beauty of photography, because I look at this image and I think, man, 
I remember taking the image of that beautiful animal. I remember seeing it, looking at it. It's just an incredible feeling, okay? That's the beauty. You know, one day we're all going to freaking die. But until then, every time we take an image, we freeze a point in our life that we were able to witness, that we can go back and see. And sometimes at the moment you take the image, you don't appreciate it. But I promise you, folks, that there are images that you'll take that that week you won't appreciate it, but 15 years from now, you're going to look back and you say, man, I'm glad I took that image. That's just, I'm a wildlife guy. I can't photograph people for the life of me, but I love animals. I just, I'm fascinated by them. So the birds of the Everglades, painted buntings. They're not permanent residents, but in wintertime, they're down there, and you'll see them, and the males are spectacular. This is, look, as a matter of fact, the reason why they became threatened is because a lot of people started catching them, trying to keep them as songbird pets, okay? This is the male, these are the females. Okay, beautiful, beautiful birds. Again, seasonal. In the wintertime, they come through. There are a lot of birds come through in the wintertime, though we have residents like cardinals that you guys have here too all the time. Uh, blue jays, oh my gosh, people don't like blue jays because they're kind of like thugs. They really are. But they're beautiful. Think about when you look at them, they're beautiful, beautiful birds. Red-headed woodpeckers, the red-winged blackbird. This bird is kind of like the song. I, I can't imitate the song, but it's like the song of the Everglades, especially in springtime. Well, this guy was coming at me. I'm like, what is your problem? Because I'm photographing. He's like, good. Like, like he didn't want me to photograph. I said, what is the deal with this bird? And he's like, give me the whole thing right in my face. I'm not using a terribly long lens here. He's starting to fly down and screaming like, hey, I'm going to beat you up or something. I'm like, what is going on with this guy? And I'm looking at him. And then he gets on over and he starts hopping to me and showing his red wings. And he's like, I'm like, what is the freaking thing? I know birds don't get rabies. What the hell is the problem with this thing? <laughs> and I'm watching him and I'm watching him. And all of a sudden I look and I go, oh. Females make males stupid, okay? The female's there, so I watched her, and sure enough, right where I was standing, literally nine feet behind me, I just watched. Again, observed. Why is this happening? I guess this is why it's happening, okay? He's protecting the nest. He's protecting the female, and she's there, and she's feeding these chicks, and you sit, you sit there. Folks, you can sit there forever and watch these dynamics. This is so special for me. I sit there in this place where there's not another soul around. The Everglades is huge, and you can find these things anywhere as long as you take the time to look, and you watch this going on, and you, you ever wonder why there's not a lot of poop in the nest? I always think to myself, how come these birds that can't fly have such a clean nest? I never see poop in the nest. I found out why when I was photographing the birds. As soon as she feeds them, she waits, the baby bird goes down, puts his butt up in the air, and as the poop is coming out, she grabs it. She grabs it and flies away and takes it away and cleans the nest. Fantastic! As soon as she flies away, he's screaming for more. He wants more. But it's just great to watch these interactions, to photograph these interactions. This is, this is storytelling to me. It's telling the story of nature. You're not making anything up. This isn't fiction. This is real life. And you know what? I hate that word anthropomorphic. That word to say, oh, we're being anthropomorphic. We're giving human qualities to animals, human traits to animals. Who are we to think we're the only ones that can feel emotion? That we, as humans, are the only ones that we can feel uh, pain or sadness or happiness or, or even, you know, mischievousness. Animals do these things, I can tell you. Bowtail grackles. These guys, they're all full of themselves too. These big males, they get all, and they start cracking, cracking, cracking back and forth. They're doing all this stuff, and they get all... The breeding season, it's incredible how bold they get. And the great thing with the cameras now, these cameras, folks, you can catch all this stuff in flight. I have such profound respect for the old masters, the guys who didn't have autofocus, didn't have auto exposure, did, and still got these amazing shots of birds flying in focus. How did they do that? It's unbelievable. Because the cameras today, I just put that thing on group spot focus, auto focus continuous, and I just aim and shoot like I'm skeet shooting. And I'm amazed how the stuff is in focus all the time. It's just amazing to me that that kind of technology, even a bird's flying right at me. So you have the bird flying, and you just let the camera do it. And you know, I understand the thrill of a hunter. I'm not a hunter, and I couldn't be a hunter myself. Though I don't want to be a hypocrite either. I, I eat meat, OK? And I guess that's me being a hypocrite, because I couldn't do it myself, but I'll eat the meat. Um, but having said that, I understand the thrill of a hunt in the photography, and that you're, you're, you're hunting this animal. You want to get that shot. The great thing about photography is you get the shot, you hang it on the wall, the animal walks away. That's the beauty of photography. That's the great thing about nature photography, and it gets you outside. That's why I've gotten my kids into it. I give them their cameras. I go out and take pictures. It's the greatest thing. 
these boat tail, the males, so they get to each other. They start dueling each other and dancing each other, and they're like, oh my God, no, she's mine, no, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine. And it's all over her. She's not even that good looking, okay? <laughs> and she sits there and she knows, she knows, I got it going. And these birds go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it works, it works, why? Because later on, the males got it easy. Because in the boat tail grackles, it's the female that does all the raising. So these chicks hatch out, they fledge from the nest, and they sit there and they're constantly, I mean, mother birds, when you have to appreciate nature, mother birds are unbelievable. It's nonstop. They're constantly being begged for food. They're constantly bringing food, constantly bringing food, constantly bringing food. So they sit there, and mother gives them the food, and they, they move on. Things like cat birds. A lot of the birds of prey come down in the Everglades, especially in the wintertime. Red-shouldered hawks, they'll be there. Um, feeding on everything from small birds to small rodents. Caracaras, they're there year round. This is a fantastic bird to see, but you gotta know where to look for it. This is a carrion feeding bird. So if you ever see vultures around, look for these guys because they'll come in every now and then. These things are fantastic looking birds, they really are. Of course, the bald eagle. The southern bald eagle now is off the endangered species list, even off the threatened list in Florida. They're fairly common even in the Keys. I did a study with them down in the Keys where they're smaller than the birds you find up in Alaska, up in North America, but they're still a beautiful, majestic bird, uh, a little thinner, but it's great to see them. And the great thing now with our cameras, folks, is that we can shoot at such a high ISO. I rarely shoot below 800 ISO, rarely. And most of the time, I will shoot between 1,000 and, and 1,250. Why? Because I want to make sure I'm sharp. I do not, and again, if you come see my talk at 3.30, I'm going to go over this again, but I don't have the patience for a tripod because I got animals that are moving all the time. If I'm doing that tripod stuff, I'm going to miss the shot. Okay, I got to be able to whatever. Okay, so I got to be able to hand hold this stuff, and I'm going to hand hold it. I'm getting older. I can't. I'm not as steady as I used to be. Put a high ISO. It's going to be a high shutter speed. I'm going to get a sharper picture that way. I'll be able to do something like this. This is a 3200 ISO, hand hold through a dark forest in Florida in the Everglades, through a dark pine forest going through that. And I'm just duh, 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 and it's pretty darn sharp. It's not tack sharp, but you know what? I don't think any of you looked at that right away and said, "Oh, that's not tack sharp." We take so much of this stuff too seriously. How you gotta have fun with this stuff. When you start having fun, you're gonna start having some fun pictures and great pictures. This is an actual nest of a bald eagle. In Florida, in the Keys, the nests are only about 10 feet off the ground because all those small mangrove trees are short. So I just go up, got a little ladder, went up there and took a little picture of them with a little fish in there. The parents weren't anywhere around. These guys are getting ready to fledge pretty soon anyway. But it's just a cool feeling to be in these places, take the picture and, and move on. That was after, that wasn't during the nest thing. But the birds that are probably the most identified with the Everglades are the wading birds. Okay? And there's such a plethora of them. And this year was one of the best years in recent history in Florida, especially in the Everglades, for wading birds. We have had a huge, huge decline in bird populations. And it has just, for whatever reason, this year, it really bounced back. So I went down there and I just said, I'm planting myself. All these images you're going to see I took in three days, actually three mornings because I just go first thing in the morning before sunrise, and by 11 o'clock, I'm out of there, okay? And I find my little spot, little watering hole, wherever the rookeries are, because these birds will go, and they'll kind of make these rookeries, and all kind of nest together. It's like a big condo association out there. So it's fantastic. So here you see these birds flying around, and a lot of the birds, especially in Everglades National Park, when you go in the boardwalks like the Anhingas, they're very habituated. They're like used to people. You can tell I'm shooting that with a 10 millimeter wide angle lens. That lens is almost touching the tail feathers of that bird. And he's just sitting there, uh, can I help you? I mean, it's like, it's, it's really unbelievable. It's fantastic. So a lot of these birds really offer you great ability to, to kind of compose and, and fool around with your lenses and stuff and still have a great time. And hingas are great birds. You know, they call them a, uh, the, the turkey or snake neck bird um, because they love to swim and, and fish. These are the birds that you constantly see drying themselves off because they don't produce the oil to repel the water because they have to be able to go under the water to swim after the fish. And it'd be like fighting the buoyancy of all the oil in their feathers. So they have to get up and they go fishing and they stand up and they open their wings and they kind of, this is a gland. What you see him getting at the base of his tail, there's an oil gland there. So he's taking that oil gland in his beak and he's kind of striking his feathers to make them a little bit more uh, resilient and dry out faster. So during nesting season, they're constantly bringing nest materials back and forth. And this is so much fun because you can plant yourself there, folks. And I gotta tell you, 
if you haven't tried it, it is really fun trying to track birds and trying to photograph them and keep them in focus. It's really fun. And the more you practice, the better you'll get. When I first started doing this, I sucked. I couldn't get one thing in focus. And then you just start getting the rhythm, you know? And the great thing is it's digital. If it sucks, you just delete it. Start again. So you keep on going. And that's what the great thing was about this. So you get all these birds building their nests, coming back and forth, constantly building their nests. There's the female in Inga. Not as good looking, but a lot harder working. Another uh, young male here going into and then he do the, do the dance. The still photo doesn't do it very well, but he's on that branch and he's doing this. He's going, hey, baby, how you doing? That's what he's doing. So he's doing this, fly, and she likes that because he flashes himself back and forth to do that. Then you watch him fish, and it's fantastic. They go under the water, and all of a sudden they come up and they stab this wonderful cichlids and tilapia and all kinds of exotic fish that we got in all the waterways now in Florida. And they sit there and they, oh, hello. And they show it and swallow the thing right in front of you. I mean, they get some big fish. Well, you're going to see something here in a minute that kind of blew me away. I actually did a little paper on it. And they're bringing all the food back to these are the babies in the nest. And they're all constantly begging. When you go into the rookery area, the first thing that's going to hit you is a smell. Pretty strong smell. Birds that eat fish. But all you hear is it's, it's deafening. It's deafening to watch all these birds. And they're all together. And everybody's nesting right next to each other. It seems like everybody's trying to get along, but they kind of don't get along. The cormorants, another bird, constantly fishing. And when they get into breeding color, their eyes get these incredibly, like, turquoise blue. And again, look at this camera. This bird's flying right at me. I'm thinking, this is not going to be a focus. No way. It tracks it perfectly. This is the kind of, boy, you put in that autofocus continuous tracking with a group setting, and it just picks it up. It's just amazing to me how it does it. And they all get on the thing there. And like I said, as they get into the breeding situation, their eyes get this light, light turquoise green. Do a little bathing there in the water. There, look at that color. It looks fake. It looks like a marble. I think it looks like a fake marble in its eye. And then it gives you the stare down. Hello. <laughs> Love it, man. It doesn't look real. It doesn't look like a real eye. It's fantastic to look at. The great blue heron. When you talk about a thug of a bird, elegant. One of the tallest of the, of the North America's herons. But I learned something on these days that people were shocked when I showed them the images. This guy... I watched him, he was hunting, he was catching fish, and then all of a sudden, I saw him kind of lift his head up and fly away. He lifted his head up, flew away, and I said, huh, what's going on there? He flew away, and all of a sudden I hear, Aah! what the, it sounded like a baby screaming. I'm thinking, oh my God, this thing attack a kid? <laughs> it grabbed a marsh rabbit, a rabbit. This is not a hawk, this is not an eagle, this is a heron. And it grabbed the rabbit. And this rabbit's like, ah! It was horrible to hear, I gotta be honest with you. And this is kind of a circle of life, not a very comfortable thing to watch, but fascinating nonetheless, because this bird had adapted to eating marsh rabbits. Why do I need to catch six fish when I can eat one rabbit? <laughs> and I tell you, I've gone back since. He is now the resident rabbit killer. And the other great blue herons look at him like, what the hell are you eating? You don't need to know. I'm serious, he's, he's adapted to this, and it's, it really is fantastic. And what's really great is, this is how great his adaptation was. Okay, so he kills it, he puts it on the ground, he stabs it. Okay, I know it sounds terrible, I know, but I, listen, I'm kind of frank the way it did. Okay, so he stabs it. Then he tries to swallow it, but it's too big because it's furry, right? So what's this bird gonna do? How am I, I gotta swallow this. I gotta get some lube on it. This is fantastic. He literally walks it down to the canal, and he dips it in the water. Yeah, this is fantastic. I watch him, I go, you smart bird. He dips it in the water. Yeah, we go get a little lube on that baby. That, oh, yeah. Ah, oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, oh, that's good. Ah, ah, fantastic. This is the kind of stuff you learn as a photographer because you're photographing all this stuff. You go, I can't believe what he just did. I showed those images to the park rangers and go, we've never seen that before. This is historic. This is fantastic. We knew every now and then they'd get a mouse or something, but this was a flipping bunny. So anyway, I swallowed that thing and went all the way down. And then he flew away like it was nothing. All that added weight and stuff just flew away because he had to feed his chicks. These things are nasty. They are not very grateful kids. As soon as the parent lands in the nest, it's like they're going to spear him. He goes, look at him. He's like, oh, yeah. And they're, and they're getting back. He's opening his mouth. He's trying to regurgitate stuff up. And these kids are starting to spear him. And they, man, this is like sword swallowing, man. It's unbelievable what they do. And you see it. It's really violent. You go, holy jeez. This is unbelievable. Birds, pound for pound, are the most aggressive vertebrates in the world. Okay? Trust me when I tell you that. The worst, hummingbirds. If you ever watch hummingbirds, 
they will beat the snot out of each other. They hate each other. They are the most aggressive little animals you've ever seen in your life. I'm just telling you the way it is. They're really aggressive animals. You don't see zoos uh, exhibiting hummingbirds and aviaries together unless they're two different pairs of two different species because they will beat each other up and kill each other. That's how bad they are with each other. So anyway, this is, I'm watching, I, 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 as I'm watching, I'm kind of going, because I feel like I'm gagging. The great white egret. Beautiful bird, kind of like the emblem. I'm on the board of uh, Florida Audubon, and um, that's uh, the symbol of Audubon. And this is the bird here out of breeding season. When it goes into breeding season, it gets all these colors, and it gets this green, and it's sear. See, it gets that bright, bright green. Really, it's just, again, what's the main reason for that? To get the attention of the females. And they fly so gracefully. You find them crying, oh, it's fantastic. And they get this plumage during the breeding season, which is what they were killed for. Then when the snow egrets back, when the plume days were going on back in the Everglades, that's what they were killed for, those feathers that come out only during the breeding season. They have their chicks, they do their little dance, and they do their one. It's just, folks, as a photographer, you can just sit there forever and just take so many images of this. And it's just a win-win for everybody. You're there getting great images of a beautiful animal that you can try to broadcast to the world why we need these natural spaces to keep these animals going. And you're outside getting some exercise and some fresh air away from your television, hopefully away from your smartphone. They have chicks that are really ugly in the beginning. Uh, you're also going to see that. That's kind of a common theme with wading birds when they're chicks. Some of them are so ugly, they're kind of cute. Uh, but God, they're nonstop begging the parents all the time. I don't know how they keep up with this. You can just sit there forever, and they grow very quickly. These were taken in three days over a period of three weeks. I went once a week for three weeks, and you'll see how these animals grow. You know, mother comes in right away to feed. Then you have the, the Louisiana, or what's called the tricolored heron. This is another bird that during breeding season, the sear gets almost like an electric blue. It's fantastic. Here you see it out of breeding season, okay? Out of breeding season. You know what it's doing here? It's causing shade over the water so it can see the fish. So it takes the glare off of the water so it can see the fish, and then it stabs the fish because it causes that shadow over the water. It's incredible what they learn how to adapt to do different things. All right, and, and they always catch one. You see that little fish in the end of his bill? It's a lot of work for these little fish, but they catch them all the time. You see them swim, pop, and they, I don't know how they do that. I could never do that. It's incredible the accuracy that they have. But now you see the blue seer. See how blue it gets? And then they do this dance where they look silly. They kind of go back and forth. And they kind of, again, it's for the female. Those are some ugly chicks. OK? These things are having a major bad hair day. But as they get older, as they get older, they start to get the coloration and they start to evolve. But all of those waiting bird chicks look just like that. And then they finally get their color and they get curious and stuff like that. Then we have the little blue heron. But it's not blue because as juveniles, they're white. And as they start getting into their adult coloration, they get the blue model going in there. And this is the adult coloration. Okay, But that's only in adulthood. So it kind of people confuse them sometimes for snowy egrets or little uh, great egrets or whatever. And the little green heron. You guys, I think, have these up here in New York, too. Okay, they're pretty widespread throughout the country. Fantastic little bird to watch. Um, again, watch it hunt and, 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 and fly. And their chicks are kind of homely looking. Um, but you see them when they start fledging from the nest. You can get all these behaviors. You watch as a parent comes and feeds. As a, it's, just a, it's just a connection you get. It's a, as, a, as a wildlife photographer, it creates a connection with you and nature and the outdoors. It makes you realize that some things don't really have a price tag. Um, night heron, crown night heron, those incredible radiant blue eyes, uh, red eyes that they have during the breeding season. Ibis, you know, I like to try to pay attention to reflections. Again, try to get down low. I use a flash a lot. I use a speed light a lot, uh, though sometimes it doesn't look obvious, but I do, and it does make a big difference, especially with birds. I'll get into that more later on in my other, my other presentation. Here's a snow egret. You watch these guys as they fish, and they swim over the water. And the way you tell a snow egret from every other egret, it's got the yellow feet. Black legs, yellow feet. But He'll stick that bill into the ground, so, into the water so quickly, boom, and he gets a fish. Every time, he's literally walking over the water, and bam, how do they do that? How do they, that coordination is unbelievable to me because the fish is only about that flipping big. It's not even a fish. Um, things like limpkins. These birds, you look at the bird, it only stands about this tall, but it sounds like a huge crane. It's like, ah, ah. It sounds like somebody's being killed out in the Everglades. You first hear it, you think somebody's being killed. And it's the limpkin. So when you hear that sound, oh, it's a limpkin, okay. Things like a common moorhen. 
uh, coot and uh, nesting coot. Oh, and then you have the purple gallinule. These are beautiful. They have this incredible radiant color that's fantastic. Um, you look at them feeding on the seeds. I don't know how they do that on the water. Um, and so it really works out very well when you get these birds out in the sunlight. Because understand something, folks. I'll point it out better in my next presentation. Birds don't produce blue pigment. When you see blue in a bird, it's refracted light off of a feather. Okay, it's the way the feather refracts the light. So that's why a lot of times I would use a speed light to pop the color to do those things in a little better way. Uh, but these are beautiful birds. Now, a lot of people confuse these with another bird that has now been introduced into South Florida from Africa and Asia, which is the purple swamp hen, which is this. Okay, this is bigger, more aggressive, and it's going to end up being another problem very soon. Um, uh, people had these things in collections, in private collections. Everybody has so many different private collections and stuff down in, in South Florida that when it escapes or they let it go, all of a sudden it's living in the wild. But this is the purple swamp hen, non-native, but now being seen throughout the Everglades. Oh, this is a wonderful bird. This is the, the cattle egret, which normally is just kind of a plain white. Um, there's the female. That's, this is the female there. The other one's the male. When you look at the male during breeding, it gets that purple, that purple sear in those blood red eyes. The female doesn't get the sear of the eyes. She just gets a little bit of a crown. But they're stunning animals. Here you see with the chicks. The chicks are really pretty homely looking. <laughs> it's like, feed me! So... But it's, it's incredible to see the dedication that these animals have. And again, folks, this is in one rookery. I am walking no more than half a mile, not even a quarter of a mile for all of these photographs. These animals have all nested together in this one area. You just have to find out where it is. Talk to the rangers. Where are they nesting? Or is there access to it? Plant yourself there. Don't chase animals down. If you're chasing, if you're chasing after an animal, you're never going to get the shot. It's when you wait and you wait for the animal to work in front of you is when you're going to get the picture. Roseate spoonbills, when they're in breeding color, they get these beautiful streaks of pink and, and fuchsia along their bills. Really fantastic birds to watch. This is the least bittern. This is a really rare type of bird to see, and I was really happy to get this photograph because it's only about this big. When it stands tall like that, it's about that tall. Really fantastic little bird. Black whistle, uh, black-bellied whistling ducks. You hear, wee, 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 they fly over your head, and they just come over in all these patterns and stuff. Again, it's this plethora. Everything has gathered here in this pool of water that is the only remaining pool of water for about a mile that all the fish are in, and that's why all the animals have come to eat those fish. That's why you go out there in the dry season, so you have the concentration. Things like the whist Right after I took that picture, a couple of them got chomped by an alligator. It was so cool. It really was. Ah, uh, blue-winged teal. Pelicans. Now, people know about the brown pelicans that we have in Florida, and they're all over down there by the Everglades, down by Flamingo. But we also have the great white pelican which is a fantastic bird. And you see them sometimes come out in these big flocks, and they'll come out along the per periphery of the, uh, of the Everglades National Park. And they really are phenomenal. The males get these little casts on their mouth on the top of the bill that they developed, again, to get the female's attention. So they really are quite neat to watch. The um, glossy ibis, another ibis that has these iridescent feathers, looks like they're made out of metal. Again, during the breeding season, they just tend to be very reflective, and they look really kind of cool that way when they reflect. But the bird that really is the... I don't know what the word I'm looking for is kind of the, the barometer of the health of the Everglades is the wood stork. The wood stork years ago was an endangered species. This year, whereas last year I think they only had like, in this one area they had like 30 nests. This year they had like 400 nests. Okay, And these wood storks were all over the place. They're, they're kind of ugly, but they're really kind of neat. And you see these wood storks, and they're starting to feed, and they're all over the place, and they're flying in, and everybody's building their nest. And again, you know, I'm just having so much fun just panning and shooting. And you know, when you shoot a white bird like this, don't trust your, um, your meter on your camera. Or that bird's going to be so blown out white, it just doesn't work. So I always go manual. When I'm working with, um, with white animals, I, I, I spot meter on a white animal, and I put it down on manual, I leave it that way, unless the clouds are coming in and out, and i got to mess with the sun all the time. But... The nest building, it's nonstop. You get these birds coming in, and that's where you get a lot of good practice because they tend to take the same flight patterns. They come from one tree and they come out, okay, so now you can practice it. Ah, oh, I missed it, okay, well, let me get better. And that's how you get the practice. Folks, practice is what you need in photography. There's, not, there's no single silver bullet that's gonna make you do something perfectly right. It's just practice. The best teacher you have is the back of that LCD screen. It's telling you what it looks like. And you know what, folks? You don't have to worry about what other people think about your photograph. You need to think about what you think about your photograph. I tell it to people all the time. The first person that has to like your photograph is you. When we start working for what other people think, you're not enjoying photography anymore. 
okay? Most of us here, I don't think, are here to make a living from photography. I think most of you are here to have fun, to get good photographs that you can share with your family, you can share with yourself, make good memories for yourself. How do you take a better picture? Not how am I gonna make the most money with my picture, okay? Because I, I, I don't think that's the case. So getting all these birds, again, looking at all the flight patterns, it's like an airport. They, they, they really have, okay, runway four coming in, you know? And that's how it works. It really is fantastic to watch them do this. And you can get all kinds of great shots and you can practice with your camera, learn your equipment really well, and find out these guys are nonstop. Sometimes they come with some really big twigs, too. I go, man, what kind of nest are you building? And then the chicks. The chicks are constantly, and they're all different stages and different ages. This year, it was so successful that most nests had four chicks, but three chicks were of the same age, and the fourth one was a little tiny one, obviously hatched a week later. So what happened was they actually incubated another egg later because there was such a plethora of food that instinctively they figured we can have more chicks. And they, most of them successfully fledged four chicks out of the nest. So even though you had a, a smaller chick, the bigger ones didn't beat it up. The mother seemed, okay, I'm gonna regurgitate smaller fish for you and bigger fish for you. They actually were able to distinguish the difference between those. Like here's a classic, this is one nest. All these chicks are all different sizes. Now sometimes it is a runt, okay? But these were not runts because all the babies had full crops. So they were eating. They weren't like being pushed off. So it really is kind of neat to watch. And you see the way the chicks were just react. So there's a small fish that the mom would regurgitate the small fish. And she, man, when they start regurgitating, it's like nonstop. They go, and I like this school of fish come out of their mouth. I don't know how they ate all those fish. And all the chicks eat the fish. It's fantastic. Though I really is. I, I can't tell you how rewarding it is to watch this. Here's a classic example. Look how much older that one chick is than this younger one. So now she's going to feed the younger one. She's going to say, okay. There's food for you, and the other big ones, okay, it's your turn, you can eat, they're fine. He's not beating her up or anything like that. And there's constant bickering going on. They're like, no, this is my nest. No, this is your nest. No, this is my nest. It's just unbelievable, the constant bickering. These birds are so at each other all the time, the noises. They don't really hurt each other, though, but they are constantly clapping bills and making all kinds of sounds. And the kids seem to never be satiated. It's a constant feeding machine. Just feed it, feed it, and feed it some more. I'm done. I'm almost done. Holy jeez. <laughs> okay. And, and, you know, they're so ugly, they're kind of cute. And you get, when they start to get ready to fledge, they're all big like that, and they get the backlighting. It's just beautiful, and look at them. They look like the Three Stooges. It's fantastic <laughs> to look at these guys. Wasn't there some cartoon that had these storks that look something like that? Um, but they're really wonderful birds to watch. Um, get there at sunrise, because at sunrise is when you get this great light coming in, you get these great reflections of these birds there. I'm telling you, it's magical to be out there. There's nothing better than wildlife photography. I can tell you that right now. Get out there. If you got a chance to see my presentation, I think it's at 3.30, you'll get a much better idea. Thank you very much. I appreciate you sitting by.